Um, hello everybody, my name is Neil Kiernan. I'm known as VTV on the internet. I do a radio show called V Radio. You can check that out at v-radio.org. Okay, got some other stuff noted here. I'll get into that later, but uh, just to give you a little bit about me, uh, I actually started out in the opposite paradigm. Like I said, I was a, a libertarian Ron Paul activist, and um, a lot of changes, I mean, mind you, I was raised to be a critical thinker even when I was younger. Like I was a political independent for many years. My mom raised me to intelligently question authority. Like one of the big stories she told me when I was a kid was uh, about how there was this platoon of soldiers that were sent to ground zero after they blew up the first nuclear bomb and how maybe they probably should have asked a few questions before they went to ground zero after they detonated the first nuclear bomb because all of those men died. And my mom told me that when I was like in the sixth grade. She also said, don't just question authority just because, you know, don't just use it as your excuse to just do whatever. But think for yourself, because sometimes people who are doing your thinking for you don't have your best interests in mind. And that's actually kind of what this presentation is about. Okay, so the first thing that I have up here, can you all see this? We got one guy over here, and then there's this group of people over here. Okay, is there anybody here who's frightened of audience participation? Okay, well, let me ask you some first impressions. What do you, when you look at this picture, with one person over here and four people over here, what do you think of this guy's situation? What's your first impression? My first impression that he's lonely. Your first impression that he's lonely? Okay. So what about yours? Uh, alone, yeah. Oh, like he's alone. Okay. What about you? Um, I feel afraid for him because he's like outnumbered. He's outnumbered, right? What about you? Outsider. He's an outsider. Uh, ostracized. Ostracized. Okay. About the same thing. About the same thing? Ostracism? Yeah, about the same, yeah. It's okay. I, I think we have a, general, a good general consensus. Okay, but he could also be one guy with a microphone talking to a bunch of people. True. You know, you know. Maybe he's in charge and they're listening. But it's a good thing that you are, you had that impression because that's actually one of the major reasons that I brought that up, is that from a very young age, you're actually introduced to the first elements of how people control people. That's what this is about. This is actually not a resource-based economy specific presentation. This is relevant to all human beings. Anybody who wants to call themselves an activist or a critical thinker. Now, afraid for him, worried for him, he's off by himself, he's outnumbered. Okay, now how many times in your lives, and I, you don't need to answer this obviously, have you ever been this person? Okay, now, when you are this person, generally you're trying to think of how not to be that person anymore. You're, you're kind of being pressured to go, man, I really want to be with these people. Okay, well, one of the reasons I brought this up, and we're going to talk about this more during my presentation, but is that society is engineered in such a way to use this as a weapon against you. So, first let's talk a little bit about childhood social structures, okay? My daughter recently started going to school, and uh, I'm very particular about teachers, like I'm totally ready to homeschool if I have to. I've been lucky enough that the teachers have actually been really good, like I've been interviewing them. <laughs> it's like, hey, what are you going to do about bullying? And, you know, and I've been very happy, but there's still a bullying problem at school, and it's largely because my daughter, well, is my daughter. and. Um, like, I remember one day she wrote this little passage, and I don't remember it exactly. I should have wrote it down so I can put it up there. But um, she said, you can't make me do the mean things. And she's like six at this point. Uh, you know, I don't care what you think of me. I only want to be myself. Okay? And she's my daughter. <laughs> but, you see, as you can imagine, Somebody who's not susceptible to social pressures, you know, doesn't care. Well, that kind of makes them a problem for the social order of first grade, or work when you're an adult, or any other social situation you're in. And so, 
One of the things that, uh, it's actually kind of a phenomenon that's getting looked at more and more now, but it's called social aggression, where kids will, I mean, they've always done it, but it's starting to be looked at now that bullying is finally getting attention in the mainstream media. But um, is that they'll get kids to stop talking to a certain kid, and then they'll get kids to even ignore a certain kid if they're not complying with, with the whole social scheme. Well, what, what do they ask of you? Let, let's, let's move on a little bit more. Let's go into high school, okay? When you went to high school, you probably didn't think of it as an evil fascist organization there to control your every move. Wrong, okay? They control what you think. They control what you, like, music you listen to. They control how you dress. They control who you associate with. They control who you don't associate with. And might I add, all of these things are not elements of the state. They are things that are created in the social situation by the people that are in it. The kids do this. They don't need police to come to your house and march in there and force their fascist ideas on you if they'll either psychologically attack you or they beat you up after school. Okay, seriously think about that paradigm for just a moment. Think about how much control did the people in high school have over you and your conformity to their ideas. You know, that's why, like, when I was talking about homeschooling once on Facebook, a friend of mine was like, you've got to send your kid to school. I mean, they won't get socially adjusted. And I'm like, what did I get socially adjusted to when I went to school? I learned that Nike tennis shoes make you better than a person who's not wearing Nike tennis shoes. I learned that guest jeans, which have a little triangle on them that says guess on them, make you a better person than the person wearing the little Wrangler jeans. And with a little square that says Wrangler on it. The jeans aren't any different. But this is something you can be seriously psychologically tortured if you don't comply. Okay? And it's something, it's, it's in, most of the time, it's, it's part of what I'm going to talk about later is the invisible rules. I don't want to jump around too much because that's what I did last time, so I'll evaluate my notes. Um, so, we are products of the stimuli in our environment. In our environment when we're young, even absent any like state involvement, has a tendency to create hierarchies that allow people to be able to control what you think. And sometimes, if they can't get you to control what you think, they can at least get you to pretend that you agree with them. Okay? So, that's one of the first times that you're exposed to the idea that other people can control what you think. It, it doesn't just happen when you're an adult, it starts when you're a child, okay? So for example, let's talk about a couple of fallacies that are frequently used, also by adults. Nobody likes you. Nobody likes you. Everybody hates you. Could they possibly be speaking for every human on the planet? No, not logically. Man, does that hurt? I'm scared. He said everybody doesn't like me. Okay, is it rational? No, it's not. But think about the amounts of trepidation and fear that concept brings to you. It actually goes back to some of our earlier like tribal times when getting thrown out of the tribe is a good way to get killed. You know, even if they don't kill you, you're going to die. You know, you need the tribe to survive. It's one of those real primitive little underlying things. We as human beings are susceptible to all of the same herd, hive, pack mentality stuff. The only thing that makes us majorly different, and this is why I believe we can change it, we can perceive that. We can understand that. The wolf doesn't understand that he's being manipulated by the other wolves in the pack. He's just a wolf. The hive doesn't even consider the circumstances of what it means to live in a hive. Okay. They just are, because they're animals. Now, we can perceive it, and unfortunately, some people also learn how to manipulate it. And that is what propaganda is really all about. Propaganda is far more insidious than state control with guns and tanks, because you don't know what's even happening to you. It just does, okay? Propaganda, people think, well, propaganda, that's just stuff that governments do to each other. It doesn't happen in, you know, in more personal situations. In high school, have you ever had anybody start a false rumor about you? Okay, it's propaganda. It's a very small scale propaganda. But it's certainly propaganda. 
Their whole point is to try to ruin your reputation, lower your level in the social group. Okay? You can have propaganda at the dinner table. You know, what we need to be able to do is understand how people are manipulated so that we can be inoculate ourselves to it, like give ourselves a vaccine for it, so to speak. And that's some of what my presentation is going to be about. Now, my first, if I'm your doctor for your, your problem with this issue, my first prescription is that you watch the movie Psy War. And if you need to write this down later, I'll get it for you. But Psy War is just as important as any Zeitgeist film you're going to watch. Is, and honestly, even if you walk away from this and you don't like Zeitgeist, please watch Psy War. Okay? Um, the guy who got involved in Psy War is a good friend of mine named Scott Noble. And he got involved in filmmaking because his aunt was someone who had been selected for CIA experimentation on mind control. Okay, like, this is the real stuff. And the thing that's good about Cywar and the rest of his documentaries, which are also good, he doesn't do any conspiracy theory. He relies on declassified CIA documents that they're willing to admit to the things that they did on. And what you'll find is they usually go, well, we don't do that anymore. And then he shows you pictures of prisoners in Abu Ghraib or in Guantanamo Bay who are being controlled in the same way the CIA did during these tests back in like the 60s and 70s. Now, particularly to parents, but to everyone on, you know, who's a human being, watch Consuming Kids. Okay? Consuming Kids takes you all the way back to your childhood. Okay? I went on, a, before I watched this, I went on kind of a self-discovery, because when I went to met, meet Jacques Fresco, he and I talked about the fact that you may not really think about it, but a lot of the things that you've been exposed to in your life form who you are. So I went back and watched all the movies I watched when I was a kid, and I can immediately see, so maybe that's why I'm attracted to that type of girl, because I watched this movie with that type of girl in it, and she was the heroine, or... Maybe that's why I like that color, you know, you can start to really establish who you are. Here's the problem. Once again, we are human beings. We can be aware of that effect, and then we can start using it for our own purposes, good or bad. For me, my children are exposed to things that encourage critical thinking, and I never let them watch advertising. Never. And there's a huge difference. You can see it. When I take my children to the store, they might like something. But you don't get the, mommy, 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 you know, it, it doesn't happen. Like, and they look at kids that are doing that, like, what's the matter with you? Like, they don't, they don't say anything, but like, those kids are weird, Dad, why are they doing that, you know? Okay, consuming kids will take you on a journey through the way advertising is used on children, okay? And honestly, even if you're not a parent, although if you are a parent, I urge you to look at it, but even if you're not a parent, you really need to watch this documentary, you know, because... It's not just about knowing how to make a good presentation for your product. It's about doing things like putting a device on your brain and monitoring your brain's reactions to colors and sounds and you know different mood-enhancing things to get you to think anything is cool. Okay, it, advertising has gone way beyond what it used to be, folks. You know, like have you ever noticed like a child will go crazy over a product and they'll really want it and then they'll get it home and then they'll play with it for five minutes and they're done. This thing was matter of life and death 10 minutes ago when we were in the store. You were already finished? You know, it's because it's an artificial, you know, it's an artificial thing. It's not real. They were made to like it. And then finally, and this one's a bit of a marathon, <laughs> but Century of Self was actually a series on BBC by a guy named Adam Curtis. And he covers a lot of the things that are in Cywar too, but he takes you through the whole Edward Bernays, most people don't know who it is. Well, Edward Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew, and Sigmund Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, was called in to do a lot of things to help design design the consumer culture. Okay, for example, quick story. Back in I think the 40s, women didn't smoke. It was considered a huge social faux pas. Women just don't smoke. It's dirty for women to do that. So as you can imagine, the cigarette companies weren't too happy with that. So they call Edward Bernays, who's a psychologist, and they said what can you do to help us sell this cigarette product? And he's like, well, let me think about that for a while. And then he, he contemplated on it. And he's like, we need to make cigarettes into a symbol of freedom for women. 
We need to plug into the feminist movement and we need to make them think that I'm not letting you smoke cigarettes because you're a woman and then they're going to want to do it anyway and I know exactly how we'll start it. And he hired a bunch of actresses to literally stage a protest where a bunch of women lit up cigarettes when everybody was taking pictures of them. And then it became a movement. The movement of women that need to smoke cigarettes because it makes you strong and independent and you know, it's a freedom torch. This is my freedom torch. It's my cigarette, and it's giving you lung cancer. When I watched that part, I was particularly angry because my mom died of lung cancer a few years ago, and she couldn't kick it, and she was a strong person. Okay? Century itself will take you through how that same effect has been used for so many different things in our culture. Okay? If they can get women to smoke cigarettes, Think of the other things they can do. They eventually managed to convince us that our entire lives should be about acquiring stuff. And if you don't have stuff, then you're useless. Think about that. How many people make judgments on what kind of car somebody is driving? Okay. How many people decide, am I going to date that guy or girl? You know, he lives in a trailer. You know. In fact, I get that one all the time because I live in a trailer. Yeah. Um, but there are all these things that people who do understand what I'm talking about and how to manipulate it, okay? And that's why I say that you need to study this stuff because it's self-defense for your brain. Who is deciding what goes into your head? Because if it's not going to be you and you're not going to be mindful of it, there are people who will be more than happy to fill your brain with whatever bullshit suits their purposes. Okay, can we play that video? And just by the way, I hope it plays, but it's only loading a quarter of the way. I hope it loads the rest of it. Play. Okay, let's we'll see if it plays. Right. Oh, sorry, no, no sound. Between keeping us relatively fearful, but not so fearful that we stop what we're doing and really examine how it is that they've been waging. There are a lot of people who lie and get away with it. And, uh, and that uh, we will in fact find uh, uh, weapons or, or evidence of weapons programs that are, are conclusive. I don't think we'll discover anything myself. It appears that there were not weapons of mass destruction there. You said you knew where they were. I did not. We know where they are. They're in the area around uh, Tikrit and Baghdad and, and uh, east, west, south, and north. Well, first of all, I, I have a there are a lot of people who lie and get away with it. Talking about lies and your, your allegation that there was bulletproof evidence of ties between Al-Qaeda and Iraq. Was that a lie? Intelligence gathered by this and other governments leaves no doubt that the Iraqi regime continues to possess and conceal some of the most lethal weapons ever devised. There are people going to find out the truth, and the truth will say that this intelligence is good intelligence, no doubt about my part. I don't know anybody that I can think of who has contended that the Iraqis had nuclear weapons. I don't believe he has, in fact, reconstituted nuclear weapons. Saddam Hussein is determined to get his hands on a nuclear bomb. We cannot wait for the final proof. He's got it. He's got it. A smoking gun. He's got it. It could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Colin Powell didn't lie. My colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. He has not developed any significant capability with respect to weapons of mass destruction. He is unable to project conventional power against his neighbors. There are people going to find out the truth. I have not suggested there's a connection between Iraq and the 9-11. You have said in the past that it was, quote, pretty well confirmed. No, I never said that. Okay. I, I never think said that, that is... No, absolutely not. What I said was, uh, it's been pretty well confirmed, that he did go to Prague and he did meet with uh, a senior official of the Iraqi intelligence service. Saddam Hussein aids and protects terrorists, including members of Al-Qaeda. Secretly, and without fingerprints, he could provide one of his hidden weapons to terrorists or help them develop their own. What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. Nothing. He said there were three main reasons for going to war in Iraq. 
weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein has gone to elaborate lengths, spent enormous sums, taken great risks to build and keep weapons of mass destruction. The claim that Iraq was sponsoring a terrorist who attacked us on 9-11. Before September the 11th, many in the world believed that Saddam Hussein could be contained. I think it's on the map. Iraq had purchased nuclear materials from oh, yeah, Nigeria. The regime is seeking a nuclear bomb. Uh, all three of those turned out, turned out to be false. Uh, first, uh, just if I might correct a misperception, I, I don't think we ever said, at least I know I didn't say, that there was a direct connection between September the 11th and, 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 and Saddam Hussein. Who is the president? The, the guy who made this video starts following Dick Cheney and uh, Condoleezza Rice, and whenever they're on live TV, starts <laughs> shouting at them. And you can totally finish watching, and I totally expect, you know, people should watch How to Create an Angry American. Is anybody angry now that they watch that? Hell yeah! I never heard it so clear. Okay. And the funny thing is, is that all he did was put together their clips of them talking about it. Okay. Now, this is obviously not just about war, but <clears throat> right now I want to talk about what I call the invisible rules. Okay? Now, I want you to brace yourselves because <laughs> this... this some of this subject matter is stuff that people don't really want to talk about. And that's actually why I'm talking about it. <laughs> so what I want you to think for a moment as I talk is why do you have apprehension that I'm bringing this up? Why have you been conditioned to be concerned about these topics and bringing them up? And why is it a faux pas to discuss these topics? Okay, And to who does it benefit? that we don't talk about these things. Okay, the demonstration you just saw was an example of the different ways that the media controlled our perceptions about the Iraq war. Okay, there's a whole bunch of stuff, like Bill O'Reilly especially. If you want to see what I'm talking about in the most raw, obvious, just watch a little Bill O'Reilly. Okay, he's like, we expect that everybody will support the Iraq war and anyone else who doesn't will shut up. I'm sorry, let me do the Bill O'Reilly finger. Shut up. You know. And if you're sitting across from him, he'll put it right in your face, too. Yeah. That works, because it worked in school. Bullies. Okay, so let's talk a little bit first. Before I get to the numbers I just put over here, the guy named Derek Jensen, he's an anarcho-primitivist, so I don't agree with everything he says, but he put up this interesting point. Have you ever noticed that uh, aggressive behavior, as long as it's going what is considered to be up or down the perceived social scale is invisible. Okay, meaning the popular kid is allowed to push around the unpopular kid and it's just kind of understood. A police officer shoots somebody, it's just kind of understood. If, say, a country loses, you know, a few thousand people in a terrorist attack, that's bad, of course, all deaths are bad. But it's a question of what country is it gets to determine whether or not that's important. Okay, so he also pointed out that violent and aggressive behavior up the perceived social scale is considered a tragedy. Okay, no matter what the numbers are. So, for example, people from a small Middle Eastern country at one time visited a terrorist act upon the United States. They killed roughly 2,996 people, and it was terrible. But it led to the country that that happened to inflicting 122,165 casualties on the people of Iraq, the civilians, who, as you could just seen, Iraq doesn't have anything to do with 9-11. But those people are invisible. They don't exist. People don't even consider it the civilian casualties of Iraq. They don't. Okay? Now, I'll give you another example. Let me just ask a question. Once again, this should be rhetorical. All deaths are bad, but what is worse, 176 deaths or 20 deaths? 176 is worse, right? Okay, well, 20 kids were shot at Sandy Hook. 
176 kids were killed by drones recently. 176 kids are invisible. These kids who also died, and it's terrible that they died, are very much not invisible. Talk a lot about those kids. Why is that? What's wrong with these kids? Are their lives not important? Now, who benefits, once again, who benefits from us ignoring drone attacks and killing children? Who benefits from us not weighing 122,165 lives in Iraq and 2,996 lives on 9-11? I could get into a lot of different war stuff. I mean, it's, it's one of my pet peeves. It was something I had a hard time controlling myself about when I was running for Congress. But overall, this same factor replicates itself all over the world. When a country that is perceived to be up here does something to a country that's perceived to be down here. And even if the evidence is right in your face, there's a social rule that you're not allowed to talk about it. What would happen to me if I got up on Bill O'Reilly's factor and pointed that out? What would he do? Anybody have a guess? Call you on American. Right, it, he would put his finger in my face and start shouting at me, okay? Because he doesn't want anybody to think about what I'm talking about, okay? There was a kid, you can find this actually in a really good documentary called Rupert, it's called uh, Rupert Murdoch's War on Journalism, Outfoxed. And this kid who was against the idea of 9-11 being used as an excuse to go into Iraq gets called on the factor so that Bill O'Reilly can tower over him and glower at him and say, you're disrespecting your father and all this other irrational nonsense. He didn't make any sense. And the kid was like, no, I don't agree with that. And then as the kid started talking and making sense, he had them cut his mic off. And then he starts screaming at him and telling him to shut up. And, you know, you don't want to bother you this, you, 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 finger, 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 right in your face. Okay? Now, this is an extreme example. And you'll note that the mood of everybody changed when I brought it up because now we're not just talking about little stick figures. Well, Bill O'Reilly, if you didn't like the Iraq war, would make you be afraid that you're gonna be this guy, or girl. Okay, what other social things are we made to accept? Well, racism used to be up there too. Are, what, you think black people should be treated like human beings? Oh, 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 oh. We're gonna put you over here. Watch out. Okay? And <laughs> part of my work, and that's what I hope that you take away from this by the time I'm finished, is about getting people to evaluate these kinds of invisible rules and the way that people will prevent you from thinking about things. Okay? Every human being on this planet, when they're taught language, should be taught about logical fallacies. Is there anybody here? Please raise your hand if you do not have never heard the term logical fallacy. Never heard it. Never heard it. You've never heard it. Okay. I'll give you an example of a logical fallacy. You're having a debate with somebody about economics, and he points out that you're fat. Okay. So I'm fat. Does that mean that your view on economics is better? Yes. That's an ad hominem. People do this in common conversation all the time. It's a personal attack. I'm just going to attack you. Okay? Or the straw man, which is, well, you just want to have us all, you know, if, if you believe in health care, then you want to have us all, like, locked up like those evil communists, and, you know, you want a gulag, and, you know, like, you, straw man. I didn't say I wanted you to lock anybody up. I didn't, you know, I just said if I was thinking about universal health care, man. You know? So many people just let that go, like they're not even aware of these basic tactics. They're not aware that it's going on. They just, or even more to the point, some people are aware. That's the thing that scares me the most, is the ones that I do talk to, and they do know what I'm talking about, and they just go, yeah, but it's just, it's just the way it is, man. So, I'm not, I'm not content with that, but that's why I'm here. So, we talked about Invisible rules, invisible people. Racism used to be an invisible rule. It's visible now. 
Okay. Um, something important I want to point out about education, kind of going back to something I missed that I just noticed in my notes. You ever notice that when you go to school, the place that you're supposed to be learning, that the smart kids get picked on? Like, the academically excellent get attacked, beat up, ridiculed, and though the establishment doesn't create that, they don't really do anything effective to talk about it, or to do anything about it. And it's funny how they actually work these things out. Like, when the Columbine shooting happened, once again, I warned you, <laughs> Controversial to kind of topics coming up. They wanted to talk about Doom and Mortal Kombat and violent video games. They didn't want to talk about, well, those two kids were psychologically tortured by people that they were locked up with, that they were forced to go to school with, and it, you know nobody does anything about it. You know, you go to the principal, they suspend them for a couple of days, and then, you know, it does not by any stretch of the imagination mean that what happened at Columbine was okay. But thinking that you're going to address problems like the ones that created Columbine by turning off the violent video games is ignoring a glaring point about this social problem, which is that there are hundreds of people who play Mortal Kombat who don't shoot up their high schools. You know, think about that for a moment. But they don't want you to be thinking about that. They want you to be thinking about over here, misdirection. Okay? Now, I assume everybody here believes you're free. Okay? You believe that you have freedom. Now, a friend of mine named Ben Stewart, if you've ever watched the documentaries Chimatica or Esoteric Agenda, he made those films. Well, he started a movement, too, called the Hangman Project. And one of the things that he said in his initial consultation, or his initial presentation, was that when the colonists liberated themselves from the British, they didn't really have a mentality it would really allow them to be free. In fact, if you remember, the colonists initially went, so is George Washington going to be the king now? You know, they didn't get it. What, what does freedom mean? You know, well, a critical aspect of freedom that I work on is freedom of your mind. And it's not just about I'm free to think whatever I want. Are you thinking? Is someone else thinking for you? Okay. Now, some people think that the political system will give them their freedom. And this is the part where I... I don't know if Hans is still here, but um, he and I both worked for a fellow by the name of Senator Mike Gravel in the 2008 campaign at one point or another. And I don't know if any of you remember Senator Gravel, but he was this fiery old man with glasses. And one of the things he did is that he pointed out that Hillary, at the time, was trying to say she was an anti-war candidate, even though she had voted in favor of a resolution that would have allowed Bush to attack Iran. What ended up happening because of that was Hillary started getting knocked down the polls and Obama overtook her. So they got rid of him as fast as they could. In fact, you'll notice the best politicians are usually the ones who get kicked out of the debates right away. Well, when they did have him in the debates, at one point, they seated everybody, and there's like a little table right here, and all the other candidates were over here, and they seated him over here by himself. This is in a public debate on national television. Now, why would they do that? What, why, what, what, that doesn't even make any sense. That means we need to pan the camera over here to look at him every time he's talking. And, you know. well, the reason why is, what was the first impression of the guy sitting off by himself? He's lonely. You're afraid for him. <clears throat> well, especially if you're raised in a school where ostracism is allowed to take place as a mind control tactic, because that's what it is, okay? You're afraid to be associated with that person because you don't want to be standing over there next to him by himself. The media controls what politicians you are allowed to see, and they present them in a way that fits the agenda of the people who want to do your thinking for you. Now, I talked a lot about some of the movies I wanted you guys to see, and the colonists liberating themselves. How can you really be free if you cannot perceive what's really going on and what isn't? We voted for the politicians that sent us to Iraq. Was that freedom? Now, even after the war stopped being popular, we're still there, 
sort of. And we won't leave until the people who actually wanted us over there, which is another conversation altogether, want us out of there. But it has to do with acquisition of resources. What we talk about is a resource-based economy where everybody shares the resources. Okay. It's about acquisition of people's oil, pretty much behind every war you will ever look into. Okay. But we were all duped. So what I want you to take away from this presentation is just to take some of the little bits that I'm working on here, because this is all part of a documentary that I'm working on, and so it's kind of like a, a, a beta. <laughs> you guys are looking at an unfinished product. But I'll rewrite down some of the documentaries that I put up there earlier, and I urge you to watch them. Okay? I'm not making any money on my documentary. I'm putting it up on the internet for free. Okay? And I want people from all walks of life to watch it so that they can learn about some of the stuff I'm talking about. Because you and I cannot even have meaningful dialogue if A, you're easy for me to manipulate. If all I've got to do to win a debate with somebody is call them fat or you know, make up, then we're not really thinking anymore. If all I've got to do to win a debate with somebody is misrepresent what they said or appeal to fear, make me a, you know, make people afraid, you know, Anything that tries to work on getting you to be feeling about something instead of thinking about something is an attempt to control your mind. But you can't even talk about mind control. He said mind control. Think about that. What does that word bring up? Mind control. Doesn't that sound kind of hokey or spooky or 50s, creepy, 50s sci-fi? Give me a word for mind control. Anybody? Is that, does that sound silly? Creepy. Creepy. Right. Scary, and then they don't want to. You don't want to talk about the thing that scares you. That's exactly what the people who control you are counting on. Now, one of the reasons I did this presentation in Z Day is I'm friends with Peter Joseph, and one of the things that he said was his motive behind the first Zeitgeist film, which we don't really watch anymore because it's got a lot of stuff in it that's not relevant. But his motive was that he noticed that the people around him were really embracing a lot of myths and things that he didn't really feel they had really critically thought about. And he wanted to present some information about it. One of those things was 9-11, the banking system, lots of stuff on there that's really controversial. But the point of the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, was to try to get people to really look at these things. Even if they don't agree with me when I'm done, as long as they have heard it and thought about it and really processed it, then I'll be satisfied. Now, Imagine a world where you and I can have conversations and you're not in any way afraid that I'm going to make fun of you for disagreeing with me and that we both, we both unifiedly have the goal to achieve a higher understanding. The opponent in the conversation becomes the wrong answer, not the other person, not the other person's clothing, not the other person's size, not the other person's skin color. It becomes, let's together exchange our information and then come to a better understanding because that is what's better for both of us. Instead, we've been brainwashed into thinking that losing an argument, particularly in public, means that I am, you know, it's bad. It means I've done something wrong. It is better instead for me to convince everybody that I'm right when I'm not and just have everybody be stupid than it is for me to accept I was wrong about that. Thanks a lot. Now I've learned something. So, I hope you learned something. I don't know if I have any time left. I doubt it. <laughs> but thanks a lot. Do I have any Q&A time left? I doubt it. 15 minutes. 15? Oh, wow. All right. Questions? Anybody? Please, get over your fear of public speaking and ask me something. What's up? Is there good propaganda? Yes. Is this you, considered good propaganda? You know why? Because I'm making you think about propaganda so that it doesn't work on you anymore. What, the reason I use the word inoculation, what does a <coughs> inoculation do? It exposes you to a small amount of the virus so that your body can develop antibodies. That's what I'm doing. I'm showing you exactly what they're doing, and this is actually, that's the other thing. People would ask Josh Presco all the time, well, in your system with no armies, how are you going to prevent a fascist takeover? And he pointed out, you know, the fascist takeover of Germany was political. 
they didn't take over Germany with tanks and guns. I mean, there was some violence, don't get me wrong. But it was targeted terrorism specifically. That's what the brown coats' jobs was, was to scare people. And, and anybody who got people thinking about what might be wrong about what the Nazis were doing, well, they went after those people right away. So you, you, you believe it's uh, not acceptable to use emotions to have somebody consider a decision or a, to come to a conclusion? I think that things like that, particularly like, if you're going to do that, you should be honest about it. You understand what I'm saying? Like, you know, that's why, for example, I made the, I, I chose the video that I did because I knew it was going to create an emotional response. But that's a good emotional response. You should be upset about Iraq. Everybody should. You see what I'm saying? And then I said to you, now you notice the way the mood changed immediately when I played that video? So that's an example of me trying to use it to help educate you. The problem is, is that all of these things that work, work for a reason. If we're in a free-thinking like, society the way that our bodies and minds are designed, then we can do these exchanges and have them be meaningful and we can learn from each other. The problem is, is that people have figured out that they can make it in such a way that they control the dialogue so that we're only talking about what they want us to be talking about and in the way they want us to talk about it. It's, it's just like programming a computer. With understanding of programming, you can write a program to save lives, or you can hurt people. The difference is, is that most people don't even realize that there's a programming code, so they just let other people do it. Can you imagine if you just downloaded whatever the hell people programmed and think about what its purpose was? You know, how long would your computer last? <laughs> Anybody else? Questions? Comments? Yes, sir. Where did you uh, provide a list of all the documents? I will totally write them down for you, and I'll put them up here again. I just wanted to put those numbers up there. Yes? Um, is there uh, anything else um, about the trolling documentary coming up that you want to say? Oh, well. I started a Facebook group for the troll documentary, and it's still a work in progress. And one of the reasons it isn't done yet is because I keep evolving what I want it to be. And I keep getting new information. Like, at first I thought I was just going to do a documentary about people who are mean on the internet. And then I started learning about things that even the mainstream media is reporting. Okay, for example, there are programs being written that even Fox and CNN are reporting on that create false personas of Facebook users so that you can affect the dialogue on the internet. Now, why does that work? Well, if a bunch of people disagree with you, you might be wrong. So they're literally writing computer programs to create fake personas to make a huge, massive effect on the way people see things. And I've seen this work. It's the reason why some of these internet tactics work. Like one of them is the sock puppet, where people will literally make fake accounts to agree with them. And it has a serious effect on people like, I'll make a fake account to agree with myself, and they're like, oh, now there's four people disagreeing with me. I must be wrong. You know, and that's uh, one of the major things. I was like, I have to include this. This is so important. You may not even be talking to a real person when you're being trolled. You know? Um, another one that came up that you can actually find it. I actually got it from another movie called Astro Turf Wars. But there was a... Uh, a tea party guy that was going around to all the tea parties and he was giving a class on what he called internet activism, but it consisted of going to Amazon and making sure to rate all liberal books one star and write nasty things about them. And the guy's like, even if I didn't read them? Uh, yeah, I don't read them. What, do you read that crap? No. You want to rate it one star and put a nasty thing on it because all the college kids, well, they go to Amazon to decide what they're going to read and you don't want them to be reading that crap. So. I call it virtual book burning, okay? It's even more insidious because once again, you don't really think about it. You just kind of go, well, the book's still there, but it, it had so many bad ratings that it's passed over it. Questions, anybody else? Yes? I don't know, questions, but I have a little bit of commentary. Sure. Um, so first of all, I mean, how cool is it? I, I've never met you before, so I've never had a talk. And a lot of things he's saying and analogies he's using are the exact same things I've been saying and analogies I've been using in my head. And how many other people feel like that? I mean, how fascinating is that? That we're all independently having these same thoughts. They're just 
think that's so cool, just something to think about in and of itself. Um, another thing, kind of relative to a couple of things you were saying, was uh, like back in the day, uh, Socrates, one of the biggest things he was trying to get people to understand was that might does not make right. So the, the two people are having an argument, or having a, not an argument, they're having a discussion, a philosophical discussion about something. If one beats the other one up, does that mean he was any more right? No, of course not. Back in the day, though, that is how it was. Whoever wins, wins the debate. Um, somehow we got away from that. And it's not sort so of. much, I got, that's what I'm going to get to. Yeah. Somehow we've gotten away from that on an individual level that Mike does not necessarily make right, and we all understand it now. But it's still happening on a national level. Right. right. And it's, just, because a big, just because a country is winning and beating the other one up, does that necessarily mean you're right? History is written by the victor. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't even mean you're right in the argument necessarily. Uh, right. So I kind of wanted to point that out. Good okay. point. I got another question. Yeah. How, how do we how do we wake up and educate enough people to enact a tipping point? Usually, the best way um, try not to tell people things. Ask them questions. How did the Iraq War thing work out? Most people actually will. <laughs> go, hmm, yeah. you might be right. Or that that video I just played, I used that once for this bush-worshipping guy that I met. When I went on uh, the campaign trail, I learned a lot. Like, I met people who, even after George Bush admitted that Iraq didn't have anything to do with 9-11, still fought that. I'm like, dude, even your pundit, even your guy isn't saying that anymore. So you ask him a question. Like, do you think we were really weapons of mass destruction? I'm not so sure about that. Did it occur to you that they might have some kind of agenda? You got to gauge it to the person. I, I'm, I'm new to you know what you guys are doing here, mm -hmm. and um, I used to be a uh, progressive Democrat. Mm -hmm. well, now I consider myself independent because mm -hmm. I feel let down by the Democratic Party significantly. Mm -hmm. So I guess where I always had a problem was. I could always get, I used to run a chapter, a PDA, and I could always get 10, 15 people to show up. But then when I said, okay, I need one person to do the conference call on, you know, uh, ending the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. I need another person to work on healthcare for all. I need everyone, you know, to do these conference calls and then we'll all meet up, get together. And so I don't have to do all five conference calls I'm blind in the left eye, half blind in the right, didn't have access to a computer at the time, so I'd have to call up a friend, hey, can you go online and go on, on, the, on the website that we put together, and can you post this? So I'm doing all of this, I get everyone together, we show up, and, can, okay, can I get a hand? Show me a hand, can someone you know, raise your hand if you want to do health care? Show me a hand if you, if you want to do, uh, you know, economic equality. And then what do I get, you know, uh, while I'm busy? Time. So it's how, how do we organize? How do we get together and, and you know people understand how serious this is? You're in a situation, and I, I recognize this myself, and it comes back to the resource-based economy, is that one of the things about the capitalist model is that it puts people in a situation where they're always working and always in self-interest, and if they don't, then the system punishes them which prevents effective action. <laughs> One of the reasons that Occupy worked so good when it had a camp was that you had this place you could go and they'd take care of you and then you could concentrate on your activism. You didn't have to have a job. You know, you had to contribute, you know, help out, but you didn't have to be working. And some of the activism that took place and the conversations that took place were amazing. How do you get people to see that it's a problem? Unfortunately, you're gonna have to recognize that many people it's like that scene in The Matrix when Morpheus says, you need to understand, a lot of these people don't want to be unplugged. You know, So what you need to do is concentrate on the people that you know you're going to get, and then the rest of those kinds of people, unfortunately, there are so many people that are still plugged into this that many of them will refuse to go along with it until it becomes the mainstream. But, but, and you can look this up. I should have brought it up, like had the link for it. But in Science Daily, I think it was, they did an article recently, and they have discovered the mathematical sociological equation for about how many people you need to get something to be a mainstream idea. And it's actually not that many. It's like 10%, roughly. 
of the amount of a population, if you get them to go along with something and really get it spreading, then it starts to wildfire. Okay, that unfortunately works both ways. <laughs> like, you know, all they needed was 10% of the Germans to go along with the Nazi party and it took over. So that's one of the reasons I want to get more than 10% people of the people figuring out these logical fallacy problems and these things that are making people not think anymore so that this doesn't work anymore. Is the, is the zeitgeist, I mean, I don't know, is everyone here uh, members of the zeitgeist movement? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, now, are how, I'd like for you, you what's your name again, sir? I'm sorry. Neil Kiernan. Neil. My name's Roger Long. Mm -hmm. um, are you organizing? Are, do you know, you know, can you, I would like to get with other people that would like to organize and join forces and let's get together and kick some ass. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you showed up at the right place. <laughs> yep. Start coming to me and check it out. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it's, as far as organizing and making things easy, that's kind of where your idea comes in, isn't it? Did yeah. you, you weren't here to see this gentleman's presentation, no. but um, maybe you can pull him aside. I better tell you about it. Yeah. Um, but he actually, he, he did. He he put together a website where we could share um, certain things that we that we wouldn't pay for. That we where we could share our knowledge. And really, right now, that would give us a little bit. If we actually made that, it might actually give us a little bit of um, leeway to do a little more activism. Right. Because that's absolutely. I can do all the activism I do without. Um, without having a huge amount of support for my family and if I had a job. If right. I had a job, I could not. I mean, right. I would live, exactly. eat, and breathe activism, but that's because I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm right. able to. Right. So it's a really valid question, right. and I think most people really, they run into that dichotomy. Totally. I, I just have limited time, so I just okay. want to be sure. Is there anybody else who has a question relevant to my presentation? Can I mention one quick thing? You asked about the local Zeitgeist like chapter. And uh, just to, for anybody that's unaware of what we do, where we meet, uh, how it all works out, my name's Sean, I'm part of it. We meet here every Sunday, and there's about a two to three hour meeting. Uh, we talk about what kind of activities we can do, how we can get together and uh, <clears throat> mainly educate. So that's the, the movement itself is all about educating and forming things like this, you know, having people like Neil here to uh, expand our minds a little bit. And then discussing how we can get out there and uh, be active on a zero budget, which is very challenging. So, um, you know, we accept donations, and uh, there's a email list over here. If anybody's not on it yet, please get on it. There's usually at least a, uh, at least once a month we'll shoot something out just saying what's going on. They're very short emails. We don't want to bombard your email inbox, but. Um, that's the bottom line about the local chapter. You said every Sunday, did you mean to say the first Sunday of each month? I apologize, yes, thank you. <laughs> you're going to wonder yeah. why you're not here. Right, right. You're writing checks that we can't cash? <laughs> Already. Yeah, if anybody didn't get that, it's the first Sunday of every month. Typically here, unless there's something going on, uh, then it's, it might be elsewhere, or it might be the next Sunday or the next Sunday. But get on the email list and you'll hear about uh, what goes on every month. Guys, and, and just so you know, we're going to have, after, um, at the end of the event, we're going to have a big round table. If you right. Know, if you more questions, you know, absolutely. All right, well, folks, to, to sum up then, since I didn't see any other questions about my presentation, you can check out my website here, v-radio.org. Um, I there have archives of just literally hundreds of hours of programming of me talking about stuff like this. I have interviews with documentary filmmakers. He's actually going to be on my show, and he's never done an interview before. You can also go to my must-see TV list there. If you click on that, it's a list of links of free documentaries that you can find on the internet. And people always ask me, how did you get this much knowledge? Well, I'm a high school dropout. I got so much knowledge because I watched a frack load of documentaries and then researched myself independently. So the must-see TV list is there, and also my contact information is there, and I make myself available as an activist, not just in getting things done, but when people have questions or issues that they want to talk about, about things that are going on in world events. And another thing, it's almost like a support hotline, because I end up with friends of mine, for example, who end up somewhere where there's no activists or free-thinking people for them to interact with, and they call me up so that they can get their 
Oh, I need to talk to a smart person for a few minutes. Please give me some time. Oh, so that was it. Thank you very much, folks. You're welcome. Thank you.